Hello, this is Evangelist. Hello, this is Evangelist Bill Britt. I am more than excited about being in Jackson Parish September the 25th through the 28th for the One Way Crusade. Uh, churches are coming together, people are praying. We're expecting a mighty, mighty move of the Holy Spirit. Please mark your calendars, clear your calendars, September 25 through 28. We're gonna be at the Jackson Parish Recreation Fields. It's gonna be at 6.30 every evening, 25 through 28 of September. Bring everyone you know, bring all your neighbors, your friends, uh, and be sure all the church members are coming. Uh, and let's pack out that place under the great tent. And we're going to have a wonderful time in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're living in a day where there has never been a greater need for the gospel to be preached and for people to be reached uh, for the Lord Jesus. So uh, join us. We are called going to do the music. Uh, I'm telling you, it's going to be off the charts. And so please, please, please don't miss a single night. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. God bless you. God bless you. Bring a bus load, bring a car load, uh, drive uh, your car, br come on your four-wheeler, whatever you need to do, and uh, let's pack that place out for the glory of God. I'll see you September 25 through 28 at the Jackson Parish Recreation Fields in Jackson Parish, Louisiana. God bless you. And we're looking forward to that for the crusade. And it's good to have Brother Craig and Miss Tammy with us tonight. And uh, don't overdo it. We don't want to pop nothing out now. So uh, let's stand together. We're going to sing a series of songs off of the computer tonight. We're going to, we're going to begin with Days of Elijah. Let's sing together. of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord and these are the days of your servant Moses righteousness being restored and these are the days of great trial of famine and darkness and so There's no 
God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. Son, at the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee. And out of Zion to salvation come, behold he come, riding on a cloud, shining like the sun, and the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion to salvation come. Throw a little curve at me, just keep it running. continue to sing, but uh, we'll rest a little bit. Let's sing Good, Good Father. I've heard a thousand 
One more. Let's stand back together. Let's sing Jesus Messiah.
is so proud my mind is so unfocused I see the things you do through me as great things I have done and now you gently break me and lovingly you take me and hold me as my father yet know me as my maker. I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down? And each time I will fall short of your glory, how far will forgiveness abound? And you answer my child.
discouraged Knowing that someone somewhere Could do a better job For who am I to serve you? I know I don't deserve you And that's the part that burns in my heart And keeps me hanging on I ask you how many times will you pick me up When I keep on letting you down And each time I will fall short of your glory How far will forgiveness abound And you answer my child long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace you are so patient with me Lord as I walk with you I'm learning what true grace really means. A price that I could never pay was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my life. short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient Have your Bibles turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 17 and read verse 17 and verse 18. While you're turning there, I want to say that it is a joy uh, to be here with you tonight. I am very, very grateful. Tammy and I have been looking forward to being here tonight. Several weeks ago, I was supposed to be here on a Sunday morning and Sunday night, and uh, I've had as you know, and you've been praying, and I just want to say thank you for praying for the recovery of my eye. Uh, I've had two surgeries, and it has, um, it, it's been very difficult, and I'm, I'm here tonight preaching for the first time in seven weeks, and so just to where we all get on the front porch tonight, I've got a bottle of water. I can't see my watch. I can't see you. And uh, so, and I haven't preached in seven weeks. Now, Brother Gary Nunn, a guy, that, I don't know, y'all know that guy? Is he a member here? Gary Nunn met me outside, and he had this, like a really important person, he had this walkie-talkie thing, you know, like a policeman. And he said, now, you need to know Brother Wilton preached two sermons this morning. I said, yes, sir. He said, so therefore, you need to make it real short tonight. You see, I know Sweetwater better than that. <laughs> and I know Brother Wilton better than that. He would not want me to preach a 10-minute sermonette. Right? So, let me say that Tammy and I love you so much. You are so dear to our hearts. And we are so grateful for how you have prayed for us. Um, I have to be honest, I'm still struggling. It's, it's more of a mental issue now than it is a physical issue. 
Um, and so I usually run up on this stage, but y'all probably noticed I didn't do that because my depth perception is way, way off. Um, and so I have a real hard time with that, so I'm not going to be running around too much tonight. I'm um, we'll probably stay pretty close to my Bible in this pulpit. So, but anyway, I want to preach a message. Let's, let's get away from that. I want to get in the Word of God. And I want to preach a message tonight, what really matters. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 and verse 18, Paul brings out a concept about the cross, about the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross, how important the cross is, in our lives, not only in salvation, but in sanctification. Have you ever just stopped for a moment to really consider what matters? Well, a few weeks ago, seven weeks ago, uh, eight weeks ago, this coming Monday night, um, I found out real quick what it was like to lose eyesight and your eye go black. And since then, I haven't had sight. And so um, I found out just how important our sight is. And the Lord has spoke to my heart, and, and for the first two weeks, I looked at the floor. And the last five weeks, I've been able to look up, but if I open this eye, it's watery, and it's like full of water, and it makes me really swimmy-headed, and so I try to keep it covered or closed. But the Lord's taught me a lesson about physical sight and spiritual sight. I never really valued the importance of physical sight until I lost it. And when I lost my eye and my physical sight, my very first concern was losing the other eye immediately because I didn't know what was going on. As I was driving back from Ruston with one eye holding this eye closed, <laughs> the Lord spoke to my heart and He said, as you see how important physical sight is, which is temporary, at most 20 more years and I will have no need for physical sight. As precious as that is, as important as that is, it's only temporary and then the Lord flooded my soul with how important spiritual sight is. Amen. How important it is that there was a day when I was lost and dead in my trespasses and sins and the Spirit of God and the Word of God raised me up and quickened me while I was dead in my trespasses and sin and gave me spiritual sight to see the depths of my sin and to see the glory of my Savior. Woo, man, at the cross, at the cross. Where I first, Brother Larry, saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. Boy, how important that is. What really matters. Well, Paul is writing to this church at Corinth. He's been there. He spent 18 months in Corinth. He, he, he's established this church. He's planted this church. He stayed there 18 months. He's, he's imparted doctrine to this church. He, is, he has been preaching and teaching. He's been discipling them. 18 months. Can you imagine under the preaching of the Apostle Paul day and night for 18 months? Can you imagine being in a revival for 18 months? with the Apostle Paul being the evangelist. And now he leaves, and as he leaves, he gets wind some, that some false teachers has crept in from Jerusalem, and they've come into Corinth, and they've stirred up stuff, and they've attacked the body of Christ, so much so that, that now the body of Christ at Corinth is starting to practice things, and they are starting to do things, and they are starting to act in a way that is not becoming of children of God like he taught them the Word of God. For you see, Corinth had four major hurdles to face. One, it was money. It was a very wealthy city. 
It was on a seaport where, where trade come in from ships all over the world and, and every nation of the world knew where Corinth was and they would come in and there was nation after nation after nation and the commerce was amazing and money was an idol. It was an obstacle. It was a hurdle that the church had to face every single week, every week. But not only was money an issue, we also know that sports was an issue. They had two major events in Corinth. The Ithmian Games, they call it the Grecian Games. It was a competition event where athletes come from all over the world into Corinth. And, and man, that was a big deal. Sports was a big deal. Not only that, they had another hurdle. They had a sexual problem because they had a thousand prostitutes who bowed to the temple of Aphrodite in the city of Corinth. It was sexual images and figures throughout the town of this image of this goddess. And this church was faced with these Obstacles of money and sports and sexual scenes, pornography. But there was a fourth and it was called religion. Because they had a temple in Greece, in Athens, the Parthenon, where there were temples of every god. Y'all remember that? Paul preached on Mars Hill, right? He even had a temple that was called to the unknown god. You see, in Corinth they was very religious. And the church was faced with all of these issues. And Paul writes back. And he said, you've lost sight of what really matters. Paul says to the church of Corinth, you've lost sight. Of what really matters. Boy, I'm glad today we don't have to worry about those four obstacles and those four hurdles, do we? We don't have to worry about the obstacle of money. It's the root of all evil, isn't it? Some say it's what makes the world go round. That's a lie from hell. Surely we don't have to worry about the obstacle of sports today, do we? Especially on the Lord's Day, do we? We don't have to worry with that obstacle, not like Corinth. Certainly not sexual figures and pornography and images that would distort us. Listen, you can't even walk out of Walmart no more without blindfolded. Or you, you, I got to step up. Don't let me run off. If I run off this thing, you come get me. I think you're, you're money, aren't you? All right. Are y'all listening? I'm talking about a battle. I'm talking about a distortion, and if we're not careful, it'll grip the, even the culture today of the church, the members of the church. We'll lose sight of what's important today, but also religion. We have that obstacle today, just like Corinth did. There's every religion under the sun right here in Louisiana. Amen. Bowing down to every known God there is. And Paul is saying, you've lost sight of what matters. And what really matters is the message of the cross. I pin these words at the top of my sermon. On a hill too far away stands the old rugged cross. Y'all do, Brother Larry, I know you've led that song, On a Hill Far Away. Well, I just added, On a Hill Too Far Away. Have we lost sight of the cross? I'll tell you, when you lose sight of the cross, you have a dead religion. It's worthless. There is no gospel apart from the cross of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto the Jew and also to the Gentile. So we find here that there are some serious issues Facing the church. So would you stand, 1 Corinthians 
1, 17 and 18. You there, say amen. amen. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this sweet, precious church. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here tonight, Lord. And you know my heart is bubbling over with humility that you let me preach tonight. My heart is bubbling over with excitement, with nerves. Lord, I'm just asking you to anoint me. May I preach what you want me to preach as a dying man to dying men about your cross for your glory and our good. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The cross, what really matters is the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross. The cross is, and, and, and I'm going to come back to this at the very end if the Lord gives me liberty, but I want you to remember this, that the cross is the center of God's mercy. The cross is the center of God's mercy. We see the symbol of the cross is that the mercy of God, that God, did not give us what we deserved. Amen. Number two, the cross is the center of God's wrath. We see the wrath of God poured out upon His Son. Remember in the garden, Jesus said, If it be possible, let this cup passeth from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be, be done. Cup of God's wrath. He drank it willingly, submissively. So the cross is the center of, of God's wrath. Thirdly, the cross is the center of God's love. Amen. Amen. I once had someone tell me, you can't measure God's love. And I said, no, you can't because it's infinite. But boy, I can tell you where you can get a measuring stick from. Go to the cross, amen. Go to the cross and you can see a measuring stick of God's love, amen. Woo, how he loves us. But lastly, it's a symbol of God's victory. Amen. When Jesus said... It is finished. He said to Telestai, that's the Greek word, it is finished. The sin debt is paid in full. Amen. In other words, there's victory. Amen. There's victory. Amen. There's not defeat. There is victory. Amen. He was not a victim. He was a victor on the cross. Hallelujah. And when we think about the cross of Christ, we've got to see that it's the center of His mercy. It's the center of His wrath. It's the center of His love and the center of His victory. Amen. Now, I'm looking at this. Let's go to verse 17 and verse 18. I want us to see three things about the cross. And I'll try to, I know Brother Gary's probably monitoring Brother Gary. I'm going to try to, try to be short. So let's first look at the place of the cross. The place. What place does the cross have in your life? The place of the cross. That's verse 17. Verse 17, the place of the cross. I'm asking you now, before we ever get to it, what place does the cross of Jesus Christ have in your life? I'm not talking about a cross around your neck. I'm not talking about a cross hanging on your wall in your living room. I'm talking about the cross of Jesus Christ in your heart. What place does the cross have? 
in your life. Number two, secondly, we're going to look at the power of the cross. He said it is the power of God. What does he mean by that? Do you have the power of God on you? Do you live daily knowing the power of God that we're dooming us? You shall receive power, Acts 1-8, after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. It's the power of God. And then number three, what's the purpose of the cross? What is the purpose? So let's look at this. Verse 17. Look at this now. Look, notice what he said. He says, but Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. The place of the cross. Listen, the cross had a very important place in Paul's life. Amen. Listen to just a few of the verses, if I can read them. Galatians 5.11. And I, brethren, and if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Galatians 6, 12 through 14. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Only let they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world Philippians 2 8 and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross Philippians 3 18 for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you weeping that, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Colossians 1.20 And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Colossians 2.14 He says in you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath He quickened together with Him having forgiven you all your trespasses passes, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And God's people said, I believe the cross had a place in Paul's life. I'm asking you, what place does the cross have in your life? What happens, Brother Craig, when we lose sight of the cross. What happens when the cross is too on a hill too far away? What happens when we lose sight of the cross? Then all the focus turns to us. When we lose sight of the cross, all the focus begins to be on me and us. All of a sudden there begins to be disunity. There seems to be no harmony. There seems to be no work of God taking place. There seems to be a lack of the gathering of the saints of God when the focus is lost on the cross of Jesus Christ. There seems to be no urgency to come to the house of God. No need to come to Sunday school when we lose sight of the cross. No need to understand what it means to tithe when we lose sight of the cross. We'll even quit serving the Lord when we lose sight of the cross. My goodness me, we'll quit attending church. We'll quit studying the Bible. We'll quit praying. We'll quit witnessing to the Lord Jesus Christ and there will be no broken to it, brokenness to us whatsoever when we lose sight of the cross. No wonder we're in such a mess today. We're facing these four major, major hurdles that Corinth did and somehow another Brother Monty, I'll tell you that these hurdles have gripped our hearts and we've lost sight of the cross and we don't have our eyes on the old rugged cross any longer. Did you sense in verse 17, when Paul's writing back this disciplinary letter to a church he loves, and he's saying, for Christ didn't send me to baptize. No, 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 but to preach the gospel. Do you see what's important here to Paul? He says, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, I want you to just listen to my heart just a moment. Paul had a deep concern that favor would turn 
in the church to the practice and the prestigeness and not to the preaching. Hold on now, y'all stay with me here. Y'all love me, don't you? Paul had a deep concern here that the concern of the church would turn to their practice. He mentions baptism, doesn't he? Christ didn't send me to baptize. Is there anything wrong with the baptistry? And ba- listen, I love to see folks baptized. But now listen to my heart now. Listen to what I'm thinking to say. Do you know you can get carried away with the practice of doing church that you lose sight of the cross of Jesus Christ, that we will be so pragmatic in our methods that we'll do anything and everything we can to get folks in that baptistry and they go out the back door as fast as they come in the front door because the only thing we're concerned about is getting them in the baptistry and putting their name down on the church roll and sending it in to Louisiana Baptist Convention and getting a whole bunch of numbers on a piece of paper that we can brag about what we've done and what we're doing. I hope you got my message there. Our practice can never take the place of the preaching of the cross. Then he said, prestige. I'm just touching these. I don't have time to just really dig into them. Notice what he says here. He said, he's called me to preach the gospel. Watch how he gives another negative here. Not to baptize, and then he says another not. Not with wisdom of words. Now, any old country boy that logged from Verda, Louisiana, <laughs> couldn't get, give you much wisdom of words. But Paul said, here's the thing. I didn't, I didn't come to you with sophisticated speech intellectual speech. Listen, the preaching of the gospel is not to be with some intellectual speech, amen. Listen, it is the power of God unto salvation. Listen, Paul said, I've come to preach the gospel. I haven't come to tickle your ears. I haven't come to impress you. I haven't come in order to get an accolade or or showcase of of trophies and, and plaques all over the wall. I haven't come to get my name stamped on a billboard somewhere where everybody can see who I am and what I'm doing. We live in a day where so many men want to be prestigious and to be noticed. And Paul said, that's not what I've come for. This is the place of the cross in my life. I've come to preach the gospel. Now, wait a minute. Notice he mentions the gospel in verse 17. But verse 18, he mentions... A different word. The cross. The preaching of the cross. If you have King James, New King James that I read from says the message of the cross. Okay? So why does he say up here but to preach the gospel? The word gospel means good news. I've come to preach the good news. Listen, friend, do you know that you cannot preach the gospel unless you preach the cross? Without the cross, there is no gospel. There is no good news apart from the gospel. What's the good news about the cross, Brother Craig? He made him who knew no sin to be sin that we who are the unrighteous might be made righteous in Christ. Amen. That is the good news, my brother, that Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and it wouldn't be made possible without the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have we lost sight? Of the cross. What place does the cross have in your life? Well, it's a particular place because it's the cross of Christ. Only the cross of Christ. It's a painful place. Jesus said that you must deny yourself daily, take up your cross, follow me. But then we need to understand that it is not only a particular place and a painful place, but it is a productive place where he defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave. Amen. I mean the the cross, the place of of the cross of Jesus Christ. Have we got swept Away have our feet got knocked out from under us, brothers and sisters. 
You can call it COVID. Call it whatever you want to call it. I mean, people are using every excuse now that we have lost sight of the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're battling the same things that the church of Corinth was battling. Amen. Well, what place does the cross have in your life? Let me ask you, when, when is the last time you just got alone with the Lord? And you just look deeply at the cross of Christ. He who became sin on your behalf. He who became your substitute, your sacrifice, your Savior. When's the last time you just got alone and said, what place does the cross of Christ have in my life? Well... I pray you'll do that tonight. Number two, the power of the cross. Look in verse 18. That was verse 17. Now he says, for the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross, translation you may have, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Do you know what those who are perishing, those who are lost, those who are blinded, those who are dead in their trespasses and sin, do you know what they say about the preaching of the cross? You're a fool. I don't want to hear about a gory cross. I don't want to hear, Brother Larry, about this gory blood. I want you to tell me how good I am. I want you to tell me about how every, every day should be a Friday. I want you to tell me that I'm okay, God's okay, and we're okay. I want you to preach to me a health, wealth, and happiness message. Makes me feel better than whenever I come. Hello? But when you preach on the cross of Jesus Christ and the shed blood of Jesus Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness to them. But should we stop preaching the message of the cross? Should we stop preaching on the cross of Jesus Christ simply because some of that group or maybe the majority of that group tells us to shut up about the cross. Don't sing no more songs about the cross. I'll tell you, you find a preacher don't preach on the cross, send him home. Lock him up in a cell in the ground and don't let him out until he's ready to preach on the cross of Christ. You get a song leader that won't sing songs about the blood, run him off and don't let him back behind the pulpit until he can sing songs about what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing. Ooh, man, I'm wanting to run right now. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is the flow that makes me as what? Ooh, man. You quit singing them songs. Then you quit worshiping. The power of the cross. He says, watch this now. But to us. I'm going to come back to that now. Who are being saved. I'm coming back to that. But right now we're going to look at the power. It says, it is. We're talking about the message of the cross. We're talking about the preaching of the cross. It is the power of the cross. Of God. Amen. I'll tell you the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross is the power of God unto us. Amen. Vance Habner said, We need men of the cross with the message of the cross bearing the marks of the cross. Amen. I'll tell you, Paul, he bore the marks of the cross. Listen to what he said in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable even unto his death. He said, I want to know him. How much do I want to know him? I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. 
I want to be made conformable unto him even to the point of death. Amen. You believe the cross was special to Paul? You believe there was the power of the cross in the life of the apostle Paul? I want you to know my brothers and sisters as believers as the priesthood of the believers you and I have the same access and we have the same power of God upon us as we have the cross of Christ in our hearts. Amen. Amen. But he goes back to these obstacles, these hurdles, money, sports, sexual things, and religion. We battle those. There's more, but those four were very prominent in Corinth. Can I ask you a question? And I'm doing this because I love you. Why is there no power in God's people? Is it God who failed? Is it God who looked off? Is it God who wandered astray? Is it God who has lost sight of the cross? No, no, no. No, it's not Him. Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. The power of God, not just in word only, but in power, he says in the book of Acts, Dr. Luke did. I'll tell you. Paul understood this. You see, the cross is the power of God unto salvation. Now, stay with me here. We've already talked about this a little bit. It's the power of God unto salvation. Amen. There must be a shedding of blood. There must be a sacrifice. There must be a Savior. There must be that one named Jesus who was our substitute. There is no salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Listen, it is the power of God unto salvation. So it's very important in our salvation. But let me just share something else with you. It is equally vital in our sanctification. Now that word sanctify or sanctification means to be set apart and made holy. Okay? For us to be set apart daily and made holy daily, we must not lose sight of the cross. We must keep the cross of Christ center in our lives, the gospel center in our lives, because it is only the gospel that changes our lives from day to day. Amen. It's a work of sanctification. So, for that reason, let's now look at the purpose. Go back and let's look at this, okay? He says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross should be made of no effect, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us. Watch this here. Now, that, that's very clear. That's not speaking about humanity and whole. That's speaking about the people of God, the children of God, those who have been saved, okay? But to us who are being saved. Boy, that'll catch you off guard, won't it? Those who are being saved. What does that mean? Well, I know you've heard this before. Salvation, there's three tenses. We are saved from the penalty of sin. We are saved from the power of sin. We are saved from the penalty of sin. Amen. When we get saved from the penalty of sin, amen, we are gloriously saved and redeemed. And as we get saved, then there is a work of God in our lives that starts sanctifying us, setting us apart daily through the power of God, the power of the cross. It's called sanctification where we are set apart from the power of sin, amen. You More of God, less of sin. More of the Bible, less of sin. More of prayer, less of sin. More of witnessing, less of sin. I ain't got time to go there. You all to be getting that by now. 
It is the power of God unto sanctification. Those of us who are being saved, amen. We are being saved from the power of sin. Glory to God. He's the potter and I'm the clay. I'm just an old clay pot, an old clay vessel, amen. Listen, he has taken an old piece of dirt. He has made an old crusty vessel, amen. And the crusty vessel is what's not important, amen. He's the potter. He's making a vessel for his own purpose, for his own glory. And he is doing it for him, amen. It is the treasure that goes in the clay pot that makes the clay important. Clay imported, the clay pot's not important. You know why? Because the dirt's going to go back to the dirt. Amen. But that which is of treasure, the Lord Jesus Christ lives eternally. So we are being saved. But what's the third point? Not only are we saved from the penalty of sin, Christ did that with his blood, amen. But then secondly, we're saved from the power of sin. And then third, you know, we're saved from the presence of sin. When is that? Well, that's glorification. That's when we get to heaven, amen. There is no more sin, amen. There's no more crying. There's no more death, amen. Listen, this is saved from the, from the very presence of sin. So there is a perfect work of God in salvation because we serve a perfect God that he that begins a good work will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, amen. Philippians chapter 1, and glory to God, he that begins a work in me, he ain't going to quit. Amen. He's going to keep working. I'm so glad he's working in me. Amen. He's still working on me. What about you? You see, those who are being saved, this is the purpose of the cross. It should be the center of our lives as believers. So, so what is this purpose? Well, I've given you the three tenses as far as being saved those of us who are being so saved but let me give you the four purposes and then we're gonna we're gonna try to start closing this thing down number one it's to remind us amen to remind us of God's mercy to remind us of God's wrath to remind us of God's love and to remind us of God's victory in Christ. What is the purpose of the cross sanctifying us? To remind us. Have you ever just been so preoccupied with something that you just do it every day and you just do it every day and you do it every day and, and maybe you, you're doing something every day and all of a sudden you just quit doing it and, and you miss a day, and before long you've missed two days, and before long you've missed a week, and before long you've missed a month, and before long you're not doing it at all. You see, we need to be reminded of the cross of Christ. The purpose is to remind us of His love, of His mercy, amen, of His wrath, and of His victory in Jesus Christ, but also to repent us, not only to remind us, but to repent us, to break us. We don't need to be strutting around like a peacock with our chest stuck out saying, look at me. No, we need to be crawling on the floor like the tax collector saying, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Amen. We're repenters, believers. We're repenters. So to remind us, to repent us, and to remake us. Number three, to remake us, to mold us and shape us into a vessel that will bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, only when we live near the cross will we be made to look more like Jesus because we'll be looking at Him and not ourselves. But then fourthly, to reward us. Why should we keep looking at the cross as we are being sanctified and as we are being saved, as He said there? For those of us who are being saved, because there is a reward. Amen. I'm not talking about nickels and dimes. <laughs> I'm talking about a reward where we see Him face to face. Amen. I'm talking about a reward where we get to be with Him forever and forever and forever. The power of God unto salvation. Amen. Let me just read that again. Christ didn't send me here to baptize, but to 
preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. Let me ask you tonight, what really matters? What is it in your life really matters. What are your priorities? Paul was saying to the church of Corinth here as those unbelievers and those false prophets started filtering, just bombarding the church and they were, these four hurdles were facing them. Paul said, listen church, listen, this is what really matters. It's the message of the cross. It's the preaching of the gospel. Don't forget that. I wonder tonight if we've heard that. Maybe this old song might remind us. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, oh, thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. When I survey the wondrous cross. Here's another one. You may remember, and I'm not going to quote it, but the way of the cross leads Amen. I pray we never, ever lose sight of what matters. The message of the cross. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never been faced with the cross of Christ. Maybe it's been foolishness unto you, but not tonight. Oh, you see the cross in a whole new light. You see the cross not as foolishness but you see it in faith. You see the cross in faith because you see a redeemer, you see a rescuer, amen. You see a substitute, you see a savior, amen, named Jesus who died on the cross. Maybe tonight for the first time, the cross has a whole new meaning to you. This is what I want to ask you to do. Run to the cross, amen. Run to the cross of Christ and beseech the Savior and behold Him and beg of His salvation. Amen. Repent of your sins and trust and believe in Him and give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll become a new creature. The cross will take on a whole new meaning. Amen. In your life. Maybe you're here tonight and as a believer, as brothers and sisters, I'm sure there's many of us, most of us tonight. Sometimes we get so preoccupied in our daily lives with all the minute things that seem so important that we failed to realize we've lost focus of what really matters. Maybe that's you. I'm going to ask Brother Larry to come. and I don't know how we're going to have an invitation. I don't know if we're going to. Are we going to have music, Brother? All right, we're going to have an invitation. I just don't know if we're going to have music. Amen. Let's stand together if Brother Larry comes. I'm going to come down and stand down front. If y'all would come, I'll, I think I got a little bit. Thank you. I want to ask you to bow your heads as we just have a time to pray, and then Brother Larry will lead us. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for tonight, Lord. I pray that I've honored you and your word. Pray that tonight, Lord, I've not said anything, done anything to dishonor you. 
Lord, I don't know who you're speaking to tonight. I don't know what you're doing. But I pray we'd simply obey you and trust you tonight with what you're telling us. May we never lose sight of the cross. It is the power of God for salvation. We love you and thank you for loving us. In Christ's name, amen. Brother Larry.